research and development uh, arm of Thornton Tomasetti, and they have been for years um, pushing the limits of what is possible and what can be done within BIM um, around Revit, but obviously also reaching way further out. So once a year, they're here to tell us uh, what they've been up to. Yes. So here's the clicker. Who's speaking most? I'm going to be speaking first. Okay. Yeah, basically. You take that fella. Put it here. Yep. And if you're standing this near, standing this close, then I see that. Okay. Oh, I see. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, is it? Yep. Oh. Gonna... So while that's uh, sort of booting up, my name is Rob Otani. I'm a principal at Thornton Tomasetti. Um, started the core group in uh, 2011. Um, and we'll go over a little bit where we are now. Nick Mundell is one of our first employees in the core group, um, probably in 2011, probably, 12 maybe, 12. Um, and so today we're gonna go through um, some of the R&D that we work, we're working on in and around BIM, as well as um, um, some of the hackathon projects that um, came out of our, the hackathon we, that we uh, sponsor in the fall, and we're gonna have another one this fall, either, I think, October 2018. Um, but uh, Dave Menz is also in our group. He just joined us, but he couldn't make it today, so Nick and I are gonna carry the load. Um, if you don't know Thornton Tomasetti, Thornton Tomasetti is a 1,200 plus person firm. Um, we have offices all around the world, mainly the United States, but um, we are an international firm. Um, I'm not gonna go through this too much, but we do have a lot of practices in and around, in and around engineering, not just structural engineering. Um, and the core group though, um, is I'm a structural engineer. Uh, Nick has an architecture background with a programming background uh, and advanced modeling background. But we get involved with all of these practices. So that's that's sort of uh, that's sort of our goal in in Core Studio. And this is where we are right now. So um, and this is kind of in the order that we join the group. So myself and actually Yonatan, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, is it was was we were the first two. Um, Construe is a startup that uh, was rolled out of Thornton Tomasetti, and we'll talk a little bit about that software today, um, which is, is a BIM software. And then the rest of us sort of join the group throughout the years. Um, and um, interestingly, you know, we started out as a, a group called Advanced Computational Modeling. And then we started to get more and more into developing our own software tools. And we became Core Studio, which was sort of the computation plus the research end. Um, Anyway, I don't want to get too much into that. Um, too much into that as well. These are the sort of trajectories that we we try to work on, and these are some things that are very are vital to what we we believe is to making our our company sort of um, cutting edge, but also sort of uh, profitable at the end of the day. Um, it's automation, and we think of automation anything you build a simple tool, it makes your day go. Five minutes faster, that's actually substantial, actually, if you add that up wrong times 1,200 people. Um, but also, we're starting to get into some artificial intelligence work, which we'll show also. Interoperability, which is basically the, the bones of Construe, um, which basically means that you can, you can work in Rhino and get to Revit or Revit to, to some of our analysis tools, Grasshopper, Tecla, all those different in interfaces, which we're going to show some examples of that. And I think what's missing in our industry um, is data visualization. And so, you know, we're sort of, we're stuck with generally with the platform that the software gives us. And we've created some apps that actually can show a lot more information in a lot better way. Uh, what does that do? It makes our models that much cleaner. It makes our, we see, if we see, we can see problems much faster. Um, so anyway, it, gets, it gives us a better sort of way to just have clean models Better, and better coordination. And then the structures AI, again, I mentioned the, uh, the portion of um, sort of what I consider generative design using machine learning. 
and we'll, we'll show some of that too. Um, we have a lot of tools, probably over 80 Revit tools, custom tools, yeah, that we've created over the years. Um, just, again, just making things faster. Um, although the problems, you know, we take 10 clicks and make it one click, you know, that type of thing. Um, automated sheets, just, just making the model that much cleaner. Um, I'm going to talk about Mirar. Mirar is our in-house uh, web viewer. So you can take a Revit model, you push a button, it, it pushes a JSON file up to the web, and you can view that file on the web um, and see all the data attributes associated with it. Um, so this is kind of how it works. Um, there's a web browser, and then you can actually share that model with your client. So if, if, you, if you upload this, 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 this model to Mirar, you can just you know, send the file or, or send a link to your client and they can, they can spin around that model without having Revit, which is, which is uh, you know, most clients don't have Revit, right? So this is, uh, this is the Mirar viewer. It's, it, the, you know, we work on big projects. So it was very important that it handled big data sets or big models. Um, and so this is a video of the web interface. You can see it's mirar.autonomousstudy.com. Um, you can filter by various attributes, um, sort of uh, make, make certain things transparent so you can see things a little bit better. But also, you know, you can see this is a pretty clean model. If you had a messy model, it would show up right away. It would be like, you know, things would be flying out in different directions and, you know. So, um, is that, is that, is this, is, does the video keep going? Okay. Oh, it's just slow. Okay. So we have it sort of layered, so you know, so you can like clip clip planes just like Rhino. Um, so it's kind of nice. We actually have it now where you can actually do measurements and things like that. But um, it's it's very it's a very nice interface um, that we've again. This took like three years to build, probably more actually, if you count all all, all the things. So that's what it does. So framing QA. So we don't think uh, Revit as just being a model. We actually think it's an engineering model. Uh, and so therefore, what we've done actually is we've created engineering tools embedded within Revit. So for instance, this tool we call Framing QA, it is actually understanding the geometric space of, let's say, beam framing. And it is doing a structural analysis in Revit. Um, and then checking the beams for strength. And it's a very quick way of just checking for mistakes, you know, that ordinarily you really can't check as a, as a checker for QAQC. Um, I'm clicking the wrong thing. Oh, I said, yeah. There you go. The videos are a little slow. There you go. Okay, so basically we took we took um, you know we we always color code and hatch certain framing for for load patches. We've made it actually a smart element, so that now that the floor patches actually have data attributes, those those load patches are then going into our our analysis engine. It's checking all of the beams or well, whatever beams we decide to check. And then it is finding the ones that are overstressed. And again, this is just a, a test model, but um, it's a way you can see it's 115% or 15% overstress. Um, it's a very fast way of getting that 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 data through. That was an old video. Since then, um, it's a little bit cleaner. It's a little bit faster. Now we have a, actually a web interface to view all that information, very similar to our Mirar interface. Um, here it's showing. Um, it actually checks uh, shears as well. So if people don't have shears in the model, it checks which ones don't have shears. It actually automates shears into the attributes if you want to. Um, so this is just showing how it works. You can see the shear diagrams. You can see the, the trib areas. It's just so, because engineers like to see like what's under the hood in a way. So they know that it's actually doing the right engineering. It doesn't do braces and things like that. It's just floor friendly. Spotlight is a tool that we just released uh, in-house um, it's basically a tool 
um, it's a low it's basically a, a quantity matrix tool that normally you do like at the end. And what always drove me crazy was as a project manager, um, I didn't want to find out when we issued CDs that we were we had you know too much steel or whatever. It was you know my estimate going into the project was wrong. So what this does is it tracks the quantities all the time throughout your revenue process. Um, and it actually has history. So you can actually go back and see what you had a month ago. And a project manager can log on to his phone and see what's inside the Revit model in terms of quantities. So it's high level, high level stuff. We call it Spotlight. Um, yeah. So you can see, this is a, I don't know what project this is, but it has the quantities, concrete and steel by each level. Um, it has it by the type of, of, of material it is, the floor, uh, what a gravity system, lateral system like that. Um, so it's very sort of uh, transparent, it's you know, seeing your model. It's, it's really made for project managers to see how the engineers are doing their model. BIM portal is a tool that we created, let me go back. Um, this was a tool that we decided, again, we had this now, now we have this very robust uh, viewer um, was a way of how do you document, um, let's say, existing building information um, in without, it would not just in like 2D sheets. We want to tie that information to a 3D model. So we call the FIM portal, this is Forensic Information Model Portal. Um, whoops, I'm going to hit these things too fast. This thing is in my ASL. Is it going? Yeah, it's going. Okay, so this is an actual, pro no, it's, 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 this is an actual project, uses our, our web data interface. Um, this is a facade inspection of that particular building. And so we've modeled the building in Revit. Um, again, we push it, push it as a Mara model. And then each one of those panels have been sort of identified as, uh, or the ones that have been, have been identified having cracks or problems have been tagged in this database. So we're using the 3D model basically as a navigation uh, methodology to get to us the problems of the building. So it's going, you know, last time. No, no, we gotta get. Okay, so these are the, these are the panels that had problems, and uh, uh, I gotta go back. Last part not really for us was that each panel had a data type, and this type was a live database, and then they include in white side photographs. Right. So the point is you can tie any type of information back to the 3D model. Um, could be PDFs, could be 2D pages, could be photographs. Yeah. As long as we have a tag on it, it can be shown next to the 3D object. Right. Let me move on. So the R&D, um, I'm gonna talk about asterisks. This is a tool that um, we've sort of been working on for a long time. So we had a tool called, uh, something called remote solving where the architect would have a grasshopper definition. Um, it would basically post their, their definition up to a Dropbox. Our Dropbox would listen and know when they uploaded a certain massing. Our engine, our, so this is two different computers. Our massing would then do a, a very quick structural analysis and feed the information of the results back to the architect. We called it remote solving. It's basically uh, engineering as a software in a way. That was like 2012. Um, similar in 2000, about the same time, we did something called in the embodied energy tool down there, which is the one I think is going to start. Yes. Um, basically, it was just calculating embodied energy of a building. Um, back then, you know, um, our sustainability folks were interested in it. People still, it's still sort of not really sure what it is. Basically, it's just a way to reduce your, your carbon footprint. And by changing certain structural parameters, you would understand what those, what, how you can actually affect your carbon footprint of a building. 
Fast forward a few years after that, um, I presented at the AIA convention in 2015 in Atlanta for a tool that we called Greenspace. Greenspace was a tool that said, okay, I can, what if, if I knew how to do that, basically vary the structural parameters of a model, get the information back parametrically, what if I also were able to use the same input parameters in terms of column spacing, facade type, thing like that, things like that, to get both daylighting uh, analysis and also um, energy usage in the same model. Turns out, if you actually tried to do that with the same, all those, par those metrics going together, it would take like 90 years to actually do the calculation, right? So um, one of our programmers was, was he, I had no idea what it was in 2015, he told me what machine learning was. I said, well, we should just try it, right? So he ran about, I don't know, maybe a thousand cases of, uh, which took like, you know, two or three weeks um, of that specific analysis. And then using machine learning, he was able to fill out the rest of the table. So using machine learning, it takes like 15 minutes. Using manual, it takes like 95 years. So, um, so that was sort of that interface, and that was sort of our first foray into machine learning, which was, um, if, if you're not familiar with it, machine learning basically is, um, it's a, just a data. So let's say, if, let's say, you know, a good example is, like I've designed a lot of beams in my career, right? So like office buildings, 35 foot span. I know an office building is gonna be a W18 by 35 or W16 by 31. If you do that 10,000 times over again, you know what, you don't do the calculations anymore, right? And so the sort of machine learning fits a curve between all of those little data points. And then it, you, once it knows, you know how to ask it the right question, it gives you the answer. It's like taking the minds of 10,000 people, really you know, smart people who have done this thousands of times, and it picks an answer. So it's actually not that crazy. It's like a, it's like a very robust data set. Um, so we've done that um, with this tool called Asterix, which, um, which is showing up black. There you go. So this is a tool very similar to the other one that you saw before, but a little bit more robust. <clears throat> Basically what it does is you start in Rhino. This is a web interface. You pick a core size, you pick the building massing. And then our tool basically splits, you know, does the whole structural grid um, sort of automatically. You can pick the XY spacing of the grid, which has a big impact, obviously, on floors. Um, we've actually made the algorithm so that it does very complex buildings as well. Um, and then the idea is that an, an architect or a developer can look at massings very quickly and understand, you know, the performance metrics of a certain massing versus another massing. Um, it is actually doing floor framing analysis using machine learning. The column design is using a very simple sort of low takedown technique. It actually is doing uh, foundation um, calculations um, and also core calculations, uh, lateral analysis calculations. Um, and then we put it into our, our design explorer interface and then you can actually start to compare those different options. So this is a uh, really new. Um, and the speed that you see is actually what was it, it, it's, it's, it does. So it's very, very fast. And then you can see di different aspects of the building. So it is um, basically we're in the verge of getting to like automation, right? It's close for like concept design. And then construe, I'm gonna talk about construe. Construe um, was, this is Nick's, presentation <laughs> with the duck and the egg, the, the duck and the egg. Um, but anyway, basically what Construe is, is a tool that connects all these software in a two-way fashion. So for instance, as a for instance, let's say a very common tool that we start with is, let's say eTabs. Um, so if I, I can start with an eTabs model, let's say I do a very quick analysis, let's say building like this. I write, uh, I, I push it to Construe. Construe basically is nothing more than a very robust database. And then if I want to create a Revit model, I come into Revit, I pull in the database, all the information, and it comes in the right location, the right orientation, right levels, like that, right? Because, and the, the sort of secret sauce in a way 
is that you know ETABs and SAP and a lot of structural analysis programs all are based on center line geometry, right? As opposed to all you Revit users know that it's all top of steel. And so like all these things are sort of adjusted in the, the translation. Um, the other nice thing is it's not 100% pushes. So I don't need to take the whole model. I can just take you know, a partial model and update a model, uh, let's say Revit model. I can, if I wanted to, I could only take, let's say the RAM forces from a RAM model and put that into Revit. So it's very specific. You can do very specific things with it. Um, it's quite powerful. This is a project that I worked on, Cornell, Cornell Tech. Um, and you can see all of these different platforms can be you know, translated to, back and forth to each other um, really, really quickly. Um, you know, Grasshopper, SAV, Tecla, ETABs, uh, RAM. And we use all these software. That's the, that's the thing. And if, if you don't do it this way, it's a completely manual process. You give a markup to somebody, they'll make the change. There's no, there's, there's no longer any markups with this. Um, so this is the Marar viewer. This viewer is actually even faster than the, I mean, this is, this, this is uh, the Construe viewer. It's actually even faster. So this is West 57th Street project. Um, um, again, we, 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 we tweaked this one specifically for structural models and um, similar interface um, you can view by, um, you know, that's the other thing what, what Construe does. It actually, you can, you can compare versions. So it does version control. You can actually go back to a previous version, like a month ago. Um, so this color codes by what has changed. And we're actually gonna build out a tool on the Construe platform where um, you can compare to, let's say, Revit model. So, you know, we always get Revit models, backgrounds from an architect. We have no idea what changed. You know, a thousand things could change. So we wanna see what has changed. Uh, so that's, that's like one big point. The other one is, um, contractors usually have a, a mirrored model after CDs, right? So um, same same thing. That the, when there's an addendum that comes out, they have no idea what has changed, right? They have a maybe a, a text file or something that tells them, but not to the specificity of something like this, right? Um, so this actually creates a report as well. So Nick's gonna talk about this. Yeah. All right, I'm going to talk about some of the case studies that uh, that kind of fall out of all the tools that we've developed. <clears throat> Most of the stuff I'm going to talk about is directly tied to these tools, so there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, as many of you know, BIM and the modern practice usually involves many, many softwares. So when I first started at TT, interoperability was one of our first things we tried to get to a uh, solution on, Construe being the primary result. But every day, all of our engineers are essentially kind of balancing a bunch of different platforms over the top of creation of drawings. The first case that I'm going to talk about involves uh, using Revit and Dynamo, and well, it's also involving Navisworks. Um, so a lot, a lot of these case studies are going to be basically how many platforms can we fit into one into one slide. The first one here, um, Alpha Mama Stadium. We get a lot of stadium projects. Obviously, they're big enough whereby automating processes makes a lot of sense. Um, in this case. We were asked to uh, deal with the class detection, which is never, never a fun job for anybody, really. Um, so there's a structural stadium model that we were developing on our own. Uh, we also had MEP models um, and electrical models that were being given to us in a Navisworks format. The goal for us was to translate any clashes that were found back into our Revit model. So the process was, you know, in the old days, you'd find a clash, someone would make a markup, they'd pass it on, somebody else goes in the model and, and adds it. Uh, obviously, that's a lot of clicks that are generally unnecessary. In this case, we were doing, um, so there was a Navisworks model that was generating the clash objects for us, but the, the automation part here was how do we get that information back into our model. In this case, we were able to export from Navisworks a text file that listed all of the objects that clashed and the size of the object that was making the clash. And all we had to do in that case, once we had a text file, is somehow interpret that and be able to write that back to Revit. Um, if you've used Dynamo before, uh, you'll be familiar with some of these things you see on screen here. This is the output from Navisworks. Literally just gives us a clash, uh, the level it's at, and then an ID that goes with it. We can decompose that with Dynamo, and then essentially write back to the Revit model an opening in the slab that's of the right size for the mechanical penetration. So basically just taking data from one platform, 
and putting it into another platform, but without having to click a bunch of buttons. In that case, we were taking all the openings and translate them into our into our slab objects. Really, really useful. Um, developed by a gentleman in Chicago called Haram. Next one I'm going to talk about. Again, we get a lot of crazy models from architects. Um, sometimes they're in SketchUp, sometimes at Rhino. For us, that means it needs to be an analysis model. And also, if we get the contract for the documentation of the steel, it's going to be a Tecla model. And all these used to be built by hand by somebody from a set of 2D documents. Our goal here is to smooth out this whole process. If we're going to have to deal with all these platforms, how do we best translate between them? And Construe plays a big role in this. So this was the project. Um, just a super crazy artist uh, wants to build uh, this sort of climbing sculpture. And uh, the idea being that they would give us a SketchUp model and then we'd have to analyze this and document for fabrication. So obviously this, this is a, not, a, not an easy model to deal with. Um, coming from SketchUp, the first step was to get into Rhino. Rhino is kind of our go-to geometry platform and we've also integrated a lot of our other analysis tools with quick translation between the two. Uh, Construe comes into play pretty much every time we have one of these projects. So this is a, a web page showing the uh, the Construe version of the of the uh, SketchUp model as interpreted through Rhino and Grasshopper. Once we get a model into Construe, it basically can feed into any of our other platforms at that point, which is great because <clears throat> this model did require. Uh, this is the analysis model. Again, super crazy geometry. This was an instance where none of the endpoints, as Rob mentioned, in the original model actually matched up. So there was some automation of the connectivity taking place as well inside of Grasshopper. This project, we were producing a Tecla model. And again, this is all just the same model from the start. We're not building more models each time. We're taking the original geometry and simply translating it into the right platform with the correct data set, uh, essentially just saving time and building models. It all ended up in Revit uh, at the end of the day. Kind of one of the big problems I think in our industry at the moment is everyone uses Revit, but not everyone knows how to model in Revit. So a lot of translation into Revit takes place. Uh, we realized that very early on. So we've been translating models like this with these for many years now. Um, it looks complex, but if you're generating it in somewhere like Rhino, it's really not that, not that difficult to deal with. Very hard to build that in Revit, mind you. Uh, and this is just a little image of the, of the object inside of the museum space. Another platform mashup, which we're, which we're very good at at TT, uh, Rhino, Grasshopper, Dynamo, and Revit. Like I said, all of our projects generally involve multiple softwares, complex geometries. In this case, the architect was using Rhino to generate these outer, outer truss forms here. We don't want to have to hand model any of this. We're very good at parametric modeling these days at TT. So this was an instance of the architect giving us a Rhino model. We take uh, a Grasshopper script, which generates the trust objects here. And once we have that script, that model there, the wireframe you see, can be translated with Construe to analysis platforms as needed. If the architect sends us back a new one of these shapes, we can click a button and get a, a whole new model. There's no manual modeling in this case. This doesn't always work out. Um, in this case, uh, some of our scripts break sometimes. The architect started with a two planar triangles, sent us a new model that was a paraboloid. Things break, things break sometimes, but uh, usually not a big fix to try and get this sorted out. Another uh, mashup workflow, uh, and this is kind of a secret project. I can't really give you the, the rendered image, but it involves planes. We get a lot of projects that are large in scale. Uh, so in this case, again, the architect was coming with a large Rhino model. We have to generate a structural response to that. How do we do it without manually modeling each stick? We use, in this case, uh, Dynamo. So this large graphical script here essentially generates for us the wireframe geometry of, of the structural system. That's being uh, translated through Construe. There's a nice visualization that kind of gives you the, uh, the section types that are currently being used in this model. And this drop down for the view by profile is pretty extensive. You can view by forces if you want to, or any other property that's in the Revit model can be visualized through, uh, through Construe. As usual, we're running analysis on these. So again, that wireframe model we had to start with was generally just being sent to SARP for analysis. Those properties picked up in SARP were translated into Revit for documentation. And all of this is facilitated by, uh, by Constru, basically, and droppability. Some more mashups, even including Spotlight in this one. Uh, an interesting project. This was a, like I said, we always get plat different platform models. The skin was in Rhino to start with. Uh, we're using Grasshopper to generate uh, the wireframe and then Dynamo to build the actual, and the background model that's going to be documented in Revit. We all have to produce Revit models for creation of drawings. It's very good at doing that. Um, we don't want to 
try and make drawings anywhere else. But lots and lots of pieces like this is a terrible way to go if you're modeling manually. So this was again a script that's taking the architect's geometry, creating the sticks behind, and then at that point we're able to translate to different platforms. A version of the, the Dynamo script that's creating Revit geometry, and then the final thickened Revit object. So in this case, the properties for these frames, uh, whilst the geometry came through directly, the properties from those frames were actually uh, pulled in through an analysis model. So we had a separate SART model sizing the frames, and we we're able to then merge the, fr the frame sizes with the geometry, and at that point we basically have a, a Revit model ready for documentation. Uh, this was a project that was one of the first ones that used Spotlight, kind of just a different view of the, the image that Robert showed before. Um, again, net tonnages, super important information for structural engineers to know about. It's not quite, I uh, just want to correct, it's not a live interface. You do have to click a button to send data up. So it's not reading your model 24-7. It is still a case of the user has to say, please make me a Spotlight. But if they do that every week, you can go back and get yourself a very good history of what's going on inside your model. More mashups, towers, particularly uh, tall towers. Um, these workflows come into play all the time, particularly when things like this happen. So the architect starts out with a tall tower, comes back next week and says, actually, no, it's gonna be shorter and different shape. TT doesn't wanna have to go through two weeks of analysis or rebuilding a model to, to adapt to this. So we put the time in on the front end to generate parametric geometry that once this change is made, we can click another button and a new structural framing is output. Very similar to the, the um, asterisk kind of approach that you saw previously. Sometimes these sort of geometries will not generate custom frames as well, which is where the, the parametric definitions that we build come in. Uh, Dynamo is being used again for clash detection here. We had that a Navisworks model. Basically the same workflow that I described before was being applied to this project as well. Uh, we were decomposing Navisworks into text files with data attached, rebuilding that in Dynamo and mashing into our 3D model. So kind of a DIY approach to interoperability for this particular project. Uh, VisualArc is a kind of a new plugin for Rhino. I'm not sure if, who's heard of VisualArc here. Yep. Um, it's essentially a little Spanish startup that are trying to add more BIM intelligence to a Rhino model. So we've talked a lot about using Revit to document here. Who, who, who uses Rhino? Okay. So basically what it is, is and, and like I'm, I'm more of a Rhino, not a, I know a little bit of Grasshopper, I know, I know what it is. Basically what it is is it, it, you can embed Grasshopper scripts in Rhino. So in other words, you make this like fancy facade, you send a 3DM file, which is a Rhino file to someone, that fancy facade ends up in your model and you can change all the attributes. So, you know, all the sliders that you put in the Grasshopper definition end up being data attributes in the file. It's really, really smart. So basically it's bringing um, Grasshopper to non Grasshopper. Yeah, uh, example interface. So you're familiar with the Rhino 3D modeling environment. VisualArc has a bunch of UIs on top of that, giving you access, particularly for structural engineers, to things like libraries of W shapes, libraries of L shapes. So instead of, we have some tools at TT that generate these for us, but VisualArc is kind of taking it to the next level. All these interfaces are super awesome, and as Rob said, you can actually take a solid object in Rhino and attach a Grasshopper script to it, which makes it not quite a family per se, but it's basically families for, for Rhino. So just, you know, this, this little definition was a competition that I worked on, and Haram did this in two hours, something like that. Yeah, it's the speed of modeling in Rhino with a lot of the BIM attributes you get from other platforms. So we're really interested in, in how they're gonna develop in the next little while. We've been using it a lot. Ooh. Same thing, a little, a little Grasshopper script reads geometry, attaches objects to it. In this case, we're actually also tying VisualArc into Constru. So at that point, we can start using the, the leveraging at least all of our other platforms that are connected. Yeah, so if you're tabs. familiar with Rhino, you can draw, draw the model in Rhino and just push the, the, the Yeah. Hackathon summary. So, um, TT hosts a symposium hackathon every year. We've been doing it for <clears throat> a number of years now. Uh, 2017 was Merging and Emerging, AEC Futures, sponsored by these lovely people here. As I said, uh, this has been going on since 2013, so almost five years now. Um, we hold one every year, generally in the in september or so. so. That's a good story. 2013 was when we sent four of our guys to the, or, uh, the first AEC, there's also an AEC hackathon like benchmark group that does them all over the world. Um, and it was 1.0 at the Facebook headquarters in San Francisco. 
And our guys went there not knowing anything about web development, nothing. The, their hackathon project was to move one single node in the Excel file, file and display it on the web. That was it. And then, so, you know, four years later, you right. know, wrong web, web viewers and everything else. So that, that's, that's when we saw the power of it. It's like we went there for one day, came back as, you know, like hacky sort of, you know, uh, web people. And then now it's, um, yeah. yeah, that that one web visualization tool has basically turned into all the stuff you see on the web here. Mirar, the Constru viewer, even Spotlight starting to use it as well. Uh, this year we had a really sweet venue, which was nice. Um, the new Cornell Tech building, which Rob was a structural engineer for, which was really which was really fun. Um, we've had shittier venues in the past. This was this was much nicer than usual. Uh, Weissman Freddy was the designer of this building. I think the nice thing for us was that this was one of the buildings that Core really had an impact on. In the design process and applied some of the tools I've talked about already for this particular project. So truss optimization, this is a Rhino model that's being sent to SARP for analysis, figuring out the, the forces coming back, member size design. Again, we showed this diagram already, but we actually build all of these models. And in this case, the single Rhino model on the right was the thing that was feeding all these other models. So we didn't actually build a Tecla model or Autodesk Revit or any of these. We built one model back here and pushed that data all the way through. Saving all sorts of time. Uh, the trusses were the thing that really threw up some problems on this project. And it actually was nice for us because it ended up resulting in us being able to use some photogrammetry work. The camber on the trusses was predefined. We didn't trust the, uh, the contractor, how he put it together. So we asked for a survey of all the panel points and found out there was a degree of deflection there. Uh, I'll go back to that. That's, that's my bad. One thing I'm proud of. So after all of that, <laughs> Um, we had 80 foot trusses, right, which is very far. And after all that analysis, we were within a quarter of an inch. So we tracked the data from the contractor. The, the, the top and bottom green line is the tolerance that the steel fabricator had. Uh, I think the gray line would be the red or gray was theoretical. Yeah, theoretical. The theoretical was, the, was, was, was what we calculated, and then the red was what actually was measured. And all the trusses throughout the whole building, we were off. Pretty close. <laughs> um, but we also were able to, having a good relationship with the contractor means we were able, also able to go on and do some, some drone work. So this was essentially taking our uh, little, little drone onto the site, spinning it around the building during construction. The intention was to create a 3D mesh model through photogrammetry to verify the data that we'd seen from the contractor re-displacement. Unfortunately, photogrammetry is not as accurate as it, uh, as it will be eventually, I think. So we were, really, we were overlaying the photogrammetry model with the BIM model and looking to see where we could find differences or, or similarities between it. But it wasn't going to get us to the, the quarter inch detail that we had from the, from the contractor. Anyway. But a super fun project that enabled us to kind of use all of our skills on it. And we got to the hackathon there. Anyway, so I'm talking about the hackathon. Yes, I'm trying to. Uh, we split into two. So we have a symposium the first day. Uh, and then we have a hackathon kind of over the weekend, symposium usually on a Friday. Full day of speakers, super varied um, backgrounds, engineers, artists, uh, theorists, pretty much anyone that wants to speak and we, we rec uh, recognize and appreciate. The hackathon, like I said, is 48 hours. 2017 was our biggest one so far. Most participants in the symposium as well as the most hackathon teams. It's not always the best thing, but in this year it kind of worked out. This is just a list of the speakers that were there. So as I mentioned, pretty diverse. WeWork showed up, uh, big. One of our favorites, Ruben Margolin, who makes beautiful sculptures. We've helped him with a bunch of projects. He was very kind again, gave us a great talk. Anna Garcia was actually an ex-core member who went and got stolen by Iris. We still, we still like her though. And, and the technology that she built in, at, at Core, it ended up at Iris. So if you see RSVR, you'll see uh, there's multiple users now that we actually had that exposure with. And, uh, we don't hold it against her too bad. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, projects. Gosh, that went much faster than I wanted it to. Uh, this is the teams we had this year. Usually we have about five and six, five to ten projects. This year we had easily more than ten. Um, like I said, not always the best thing. The rivet specific ones I've kind of listed out here. The ones in the red X are the ones I'm going to talk about uh, in this um, in this presentation. Uh, duct people were the winner of of last year. There's a wide range. The idea with presenting here is to kind of give you a flavor of what we do. It's not all hard work and and super geeks, um, you know, sometimes you just want to integrate uh, Dynamo with your MIDI system, for example. I don't have a video of these guys, but they basically 
were able to take, oh, I do have a video, awesome. A Dynamo model, very simple, but they wanted a physical input for it. So all they did was take the output from the MIDI controller, throw it into a bunch of sliders, and you get something that looks like this. They did have a second video, which I'm not gonna show, which actually uh, controlled the beats. Uh, you could actually make some music with the MIDI slider in Dynamo. But you know, kind of giving you a flavor of what we do at the Hackathon is not all super serious work. Some people wanna just do Dynamo MIDI stuff. Um, <laughs> DG Bash, this is a really cool tool developed by someone in Core. Uh, and a couple of other helpers. It's not quite Revit focused, but I think it's just a really, really fun tool. It's essentially taking the idea of how architects work with a sketch pad and trying to translate that directly from a sketch into a 3D modeling environment. So we all know how to draw. Well, most of us do for the most part. Let's just play something. Uh, and in this case, it's really just a case of taking a, a black and white drawing, uh, getting the, the vectors out of that drawing. So taking each of these cells, turn it into something that you can actually use inside of a different platform. So in this case, Leland's doing his, his name, he's taking it into Rhino, and it, all of a sudden it's an object he can use to make extrusions from. So take this to the next level. What about if you started adding qualifiers to what you draw? So if you draw something on a page, it gives it a type. The, the software understands that type, and you can actually make more interactive diagrams from it. So in this case, he's drawing a couple of ground plan forms, some sort of thing called a feature, an emitter, an area of interest and the mass objects. Put it all together, he's just in sketch mode right now, 2D, drawing an arrow for a feature, plug it into Rhino Grasshopper, and very quickly is able to kind of slide through options based on the sketch. So this was just one example of a hack project, uh, 48 hours or so. There was some work before this, I should say. He didn't come into this completely blind, but super nice interface, super nice result, I thought. Me ooh, meta shape. Um, we're machine learning much geometry. So we're all familiar with point clouds, big city models. We see them these days. You can see a, you know, a city with all the towers that are involved in it. It's kind of a mess of data at the moment still. Google's getting better at figuring that stuff out. But what about engineers? Um, given a set of geometries, can we find similar geometries? That was kind of the goal of this project. Pretty big team. Um, inspirations were things like these heat maps of sites, but not really satisfied with the 2D nature of it. Uh, and again, looking at... Uh, this example from these people here. But how would you pass the geometry, basically? Uh, how do you find out what a shape of an object is in an automated fashion? These are some sketches to start with. So if we had, let's say, the, the uh, I think it's Empire State Building-ish, how do we figure out what shape that building is in an automated fashion? A couple of approaches, ray tracing from a centroid. So I have a center point here, shoot out rays from the center, Measure the distances, you can get yourself uh, sort of an ideal solid from that by using the vertices. The other option would be uh, slicing up the towers, which is, this is actually what got pushed forward in, in the project. So take a large model of a, of, a, of, a, of a city, do some geometric passing on that model, and then be able to output, for example, where you might have more terraces on a building, less terraces on a building. Typing geometries in an automated fashion was the goal here. Uh, like I said, slices was the was the um, the approach that kind of worked out the best. And at the end of the day, they're ooh, they're looking for ratios between the different geometries to define the the the, the classifications of it. Surface to area, massing to bounding box, minimum surface area, all give you different kind of results. When you kind of add all these up, you can get to something a, a little more more. Interactive. This is this is basically just the clustering of the objects. So reading that city model and then finding out the objects that have the least or the most, depending on the uh, the attribute you're looking to to define. They did actually manage to push it up to a web interface, which is very impressive in a weekend. So they had a, a big data set in Rhino, did most of the processing in Rhino, but then with all these cool visualization tools that TT has available, very easy in this case to make a little web page that allows you to give some feedback to the user. It's not interactive, you can't make changes here, but you can upload a different city site if you want and get a different clustering output from it. The meta team kind of gives you a flavor of the evening. We're in a raw space in that, in that building, so I didn't have any fit out and all the fireproofing was still in the columns. Um, and I think this is probably about four in the morning. Everyone's trying very hard. Next project, uh, a nice rivet one. This is kind of, this is just a, a very simple tool but does something that we all think that we want to have done for us in Revit for the most part. Revelations. The team, uh, three TTs in the middle, a couple of extras on the outside. Uh, repetitive groups. 
we're all familiar with making model groups in Revit. That's what kind of families were designed to address. Um, when you make groups, editing groups can be somewhat painful. What this tool is designed to do is create a parent-child relationship between one object or a set of objects and all the other children of that object. And in this instance, they were using a furniture layout inside of a sim single room. And the idea is that you make a change to the original, all the others are able to update accurately. I believe there's a little video, at least it should be. So uh, the key here is the plate. The plate is the thing that has intelligence in this case. Once you define a plate as being uh, this, this object you can use for revelations, uh, you can then apply that logic to other pads at this point. Click OK and you then populate or instantiate essentially the objects you had to begin with at all the other levels. You can make changes to the original, move things around, realign things, and then basically force those changes onto all of the, the children objects. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty close to how model groups want to be working in Revit, but they don't give you all of the ability to make changes as quickly as, as this guy does. So, it, you know, not a, not a very complex idea, but uh, a really good um, solution for just the amount of time that was put into it. Unfortunately, they didn't win, but they did very well. And it doesn't have to apply to just furniture, right? right? These, these can be scaled up to building objects, whole families, whole facade systems. Um, doesn't really matter. The winners, duck people. Um, unfortunately, I don't know any of, these, any of these people here, so I'm going to be presenting for them. My apologies. Uh, these were, were a bunch of mechanical engineers. First time at the hackathon. Uh, and any kind of engineering um, problem, or at least I find engineering problems are easier to solve than, than aesthetic ones or architectural ones. In this case, they were concerned about layout of ducting and basically the systems involved. Uh, usually, well, the issues here, manual and error prone for the most part. Uh, there's no optimizations and calculations are actually performed well beyond when they should be because you don't get the model from the architect in time. So they're essentially looking to try and automate a small portion of this process. One of the parts about the hackathon is not always the team that did the most work wins. The team that had kind of the best solution for the time or the, the type of project we were looking for wins. In this case, some real novices taking a stab at using Dynamo to begin with to lay out duct systems and then to essentially automate their already existing process of generation analysis, transfer, and visualization. They were doing that manually already. The goal in this case was to, to automate it to a degree. So they started out with a Dynamo interface. So usually you kind of build up your skill set here. They started out early in the evening working with visual scripting. Um, just give that a click. So in this case, they're looking to, like I said, automate the, the placement of the air outputs. Uh, they've got a couple of rooms. They've defined some walls, some doors. They're gonna choose the room they want to populate in this case. These are just standard Revit objects, rooms and whatnot. Run the Dynamo script, which is, which is large, but um, not as complex as it, as it seems. And all that's really doing is spacing out these points and then populating or instantiating those objects in the Revit model. This is work they do manually, uh, and all you really need is the geometric input to make these choices for you. Make changes to the walls, you can then regenerate the layout of these objects. They were able to actually get it working in Revit as well. So the second step, once you've kind of got a Dynamo script working in Visual Script, is you want to make a plugin that does this for you. Now, so this is kind of pretty much the same demo. I don't have to spend too much time on it, but um, it's a big step moving from visual programming into the actual uh, UI that's included in the in the Revit toolbar. And this was kind of I think what got them the what got them the prize this year. They went from zero to a fully functioning tool that worked for them. Uh, in, in, the, in the weekend. There you go, laying out ductwork. So not all, you know, not, not everything is, you know, whiz bang exciting at the hackathon. It's usually just a, a mix of people that are looking to solve problems that they deal with every day or looking to have some fun, like I said, with the, with the MIDI Explorer. And I, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. Appreciate it. Yeah, I didn't throw up the links to the GitHub pages, but pretty much all the code in the background of almost all those projects is fully available online for anyone to go and look at and peruse.